it is time to do some more coding. What I've got here, and at this point I'm pointing off to the right where you can't see me, is a AlphaSmart Dana device. This, and I'm showing you a picture on screen now, is a laptop-like device from... I can't remember when. It's technically a Palmos tablet. It's got a full-sized keyboard, a decent screen, massive battery life, and it runs off a 33 megahertz 68,000. Out of the box, and indeed at all, it runs Palmos uh, via a flash chip. Uh, it works fine. However, I recently discovered this, which is the manual for the system on a chip that's based around, and discovered that it is highly hackable. And in uh, the previous video in what I hope to be a series, I took the lid off and figured out the pinout, the debug port, and actually got it working in bootstrap mode here. So I am now capable, with the appropriate software, of bypassing the entire ROM of the device and starting the thing up in debug mode and downloading and running code onto it via a serial port. So I need some software to do this. I've done the hardware side, now I actually need to write a client that talks this protocol. So that is what I'm going to do today. Now I've got the data sheet here. Over here I have the uh, development environment set up via if I very nearly set up, let's just uh, make this thing work. Yeah, it should do fine. Uh, so that I can write code and it will automatically compile and everything. Over here, I have a disassembly of the processor's bootstrap ROM. This is the excellent Ghidra reverse engineering tool, which is the best 68,000 disassembler I'm aware of. Uh, the Bootstrap code is uh, about 190 bytes of machine code that live on the processor itself. And to get at it, you set up the, you, you ground a pin on the processor and hit the reset button, and it boots into this. So with this, I can tell what it's doing. You see, there's not a lot of it. And the actual protocol itself is relatively well documented. It only does two things. It downloads data into the machine and it runs stuff. So I'm going to try and put together a rather more flexible tool that does things like reading data as well. Uh, I've done this before for other devices. Um, I'm going to copy big chunks from one of those, so uh, so this is the main from a program I wrote in 2005, which talks to the Amstrad uh, personal organizer, Amstrad emailer bootloader for doing basically precisely this. And as this has got all the code in it for talking to the serial port and so on and using subcommands and argument parsing, I'll just use that. So first, let's just trim out the stuff we don't need. We've only got one board rate. This thing starts up at 19.2. We should be able to change that later. Don't want that, don't want that, don't want either of those. Uh, The processor itself is, I did say it was a 68,000 derivative, but it is called the Dragon Ball 68VZ328. It's compatible with the vanilla 68,000, so it's got no memory management unit, but it runs it up to 33 megahertz, which is pretty fast for a 68,000. Wow, I wrote this in 20, 2005. Um, so we don't need any of that. 
Uh, we actually we don't want any of that. Uh, we do want the we do want port. Okay, so um, these are all the commands I did for PBLQ. I don't think I'm going to get through all of these. I just want to do read and write for the time being. And this is going to be interesting for reasons I will explain later. Um, so let's just do those and that. We don't want bless. We don't want checksum. Okay. So powers options, we... Uh, minus E no longer exists. P does exist. F and S exist. Packet size, no. There we go. So we've got ping term, we've got no bless, we've got execute, uh, we've got no checksum, read write, and we don't have read flash and write flash. Okay, so let's just create our globals.h. Uh, did I actually remember to add any of this stuff? No, I did not. Okay, so... This program is in pretty vague C++. Which is one of my least favorite languages, but... Uh, it's kind of the best one for this job. Okay, I need some more stuff stolen from PBLQ. So, utils. Which has got standard routines for displaying various things and getting the yeah, simple timers. Good. We now need to add this to our build tool. So my preferred build tool these days is basically defined as anything but make. What I seem to have settled on is the Ninja build tool, which is very fast and flexible but has got a lousy input language and a shell script which is this one for actually generating the files used by Ninja. Um, we do have a utils.cc. Oh right you can't do that with with uh, build library so Yeah, it, the shell script is pretty simple, but it does understand most C things. Um, a. Uh, yeah, I think that's all you want. Okay, better. So, just steal some more things, including some definitions. So log on is the routine which is going to 
set up the connection to the uh, the bootstrap and just generally make sure that, that we are correctly talking to the board. And now we want a bunch of these for our subcommands. So we've got right. Read exec uh, execute is called rather. Yeah, I wrote this in two thousand and five. I, you know, can't really remember how any of it works. Uh, oh yes, we want a version. Which we're going to set here for simplicity. Ah, dodgy term. Yes, dodgy term is a very simple serial terminal because, okay, uh, that is something that you nearly always want to have on this kind of machine. So we're probably going to want serial.c, which will contain this. Add this to our list of source files. And now we need to make it work. So this contains all the code for talking to the serial port, including some protocol-based stuff. This is setting up the connection to the Amstrad emailer. So we don't want any of that. Uh, this actually speaks both the E2 for the emailer 2 and the E3 protocol, neither of which we care about. So log on we connect to the serial port uh, we'll take this out but we might want to put it back again much later and then this code is supposed to talk to the emailer just to see if it works. We don't have any of that. Then changes board rate to a much faster one. We don't want that. Here's the serial terminal. Okay. Yes, I have stopped defining my own byte types in the 16 years since I wrote this. That's terrifying. Uh, oh, yeah, and we want to strip out nearly all the sync stuff. So I will just stub that out for the time being. Why is log on to find a packet there? Also int, we don't want that. Yes, I appear to have written this in uh, C89. Yeah. Uh, I think we got rid of. We did get rid of slow board rate. Yes, yeah, so let's just put this here.
that's the board rate at which the uh, the Dana's bootstrap loader initializes. Changing it is complicated, um, and we'll get on to that later, but let's make the rest of it work first. Okay, so it is now connecting. We want to add read and write, which we will copy from Uh, the from PPLQ. Why is there no read in there? Uh, so this is okay. Let's take. We don't want to write to flash, or rather, we do want to write to flash, but we haven't done that bit yet. Uh, all this code is going to be different because uh, it's a different protocol. Okay, now where is read? Apparently I put it in the checksum command. Why did I do that? Oh, I remember how this works. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the the Amstrad emailer doesn't the bootstrap on that doesn't actually support reading back data, but it does support getting a checksum. So what I do is I check some ever increasing areas of memory, and then based on the two checksums, I can compute what the byte is supposed to be. Actually, I seem to be checksumming one byte at a time. It is ruinously slow, but it does work. So instead of doing that, we're actually going to copy our write. It's essentially the same operation. And actually implementing this is going to be a nightmare. Right, just want to stick in an error here to say it doesn't work. Ah, oh, we haven't done execute. So the way these all work is there's a function that does the work and there's a function that uh, parses the thing the user provided. The idea is that these are executable by uh, other parts of the system to make it reasonably modular, which we do want. We'll just get, we'll get there eventually. So we want to parse um, So 
So, uh, the argument contains one. Ah, oh, here we go. The command list for execute contains one value, which is the start address, which we get here. The second value must be null because otherwise there are too many provided, so that makes the syntax check easy. And we just stick this in here. Uh, that should be an address. This should be S. Good. All right, so if we run it, and let's just change. Oh, yeah, that will be in details. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is ping, which does absolutely nothing because we didn't do any synchronized code. Now, what we want to do is when the user calls ping, which is just used to make sure that the board is responding, that just calls log on and does nothing else. Log on is here in this code. This uh, opens the serial port, sets it up, and then synchronizes, which is when we poke the board to make sure that it is uh, responding correctly. Now, if I fire up my own serial terminal, at the right address, okay, uh, so this is the bootstrap loader running. It's just echoing out all my stuff. If I now push the reset button, nothing happens but the board has reset. Now we send one byte uh, one byte? Ah, we send uh, we have to send the right byte, which in this case is return, and the board responds with a at sign, which indicates that the bootstrap loader is ready and running. And I can show you the code for this. Bootloader entry here. This then sets up the serial ports. Here we have a loop that uh, just spins looking for data on either of the two UARTs. Uh, once the user ha once it has received a byte, it then goes to uh, here, and this instruction is the one that sends the at sign, which is hex 40, to the designated UART. So, uh, let me think. Okay, so I'm typing capital A's, and the first one comes out with an at sign, and then they're all echoed. At sign itself is echoed. So if I reset, then type an at sign, I get the first at sign indicating that the board is ready. Let me type another one, and we get an at sign indicating that the uh, that it's echoed back the at sign I just sent it. So, what we're going to do is we have to keep poking the board before it will respond. So, let us... 
do we have read and write bytes commands? We do. Uh, that will wait forever. Right, I don't think we want to use those. Those are used for actually sending and receiving data. So we just want to first write a byte. We want to repeatedly send an at sign and then try to read back a result. And we're just going to keep doing this until we get an at sign. So first we do the right. If it fails, Actually, no, we don't care about the result. Are we opening this in non-blocking mode? Yes, we are opening it in non-blocking mode. So whether this works or not, it will return immediately. We're now going to wait back for some data. We're now going to read one byte of data and again we don't care about the return value if we read back an at sign then we have successfully synchronized um, I'm thinking that we do actually yeah, we are, let's, let's actually just check this. and everything else we don't need anymore. Okay. I think that is our synchronization. So, if we run call, if we run the ping command, It worked. Okay, let's hit the reset button. Uh, the reason why that worked is because it output the, as the board is already in bootstrap mode, therefore we sent the at sign and got back the echo. So I pressed the reset button, now we do it again. And it sent the at sign and the board was activated. So we are now talking to the bootstrap loader. We can start doing more interesting things. Now, we could immediately start work on write and uh, send the, where's the bootstrap mode docs, and using the bootstrap loader's own protocol so that uh, in order to write data you send it uh, a record containing the address you want it to write to, the number of bytes and the data. But we're not going to do that. The reason we're not going to do that is 
because this is an example of what you actually send to the board. And you notice it's all in ASCII. The data you send it is in hex nibbles. Uh, this text on the right is all ignored. Because it's all hex nibbles, this means that uh, we're wasting half the bandwidth of the rather slow serial connection. So we are going to do better than that. So in order to read and write stuff, what we're actually going to do is to upload a fragment of 68,000 machine code that implements a much more efficient protocol. But to do that, we are going to have to implement code that actually speaks this protocol so we can upload the uh, the machine code programs. So let's add in a file for the library that's going to do that. And So the protocol only has two operations, there's execute and there's write. Um, which are going to be implemented by these. So let's put these in, uh, let me open the file, let's put these in here, let's steal our headers from main, uh, here, Okay, this is, I mean, because it's all hex, it's incredibly easy to actually implement. So we are just going to uh, write out uh, the text record into a string. I should probably have imported the C++ format library, but I haven't. Did I implement? No. Sometimes in the standard utils, I put in a uh, a printf to a string or such like routine. Actually, let's do that. printf to a C++ string. Um, going to be using sprintf to count the number of bytes. Uh, vsprintf. If you do an sprintf to null, then it doesn't do anything other than count. Um, 
return value of s in printf interesting yeah I think that'll work we'll test it and see So now we create a string that is big enough um, so VSN printf. So we are going to write to Uh, our C++ string only allow this many bytes format app and app turn s yeah. did I mention C++ isn't my favorite language we have to include uh, this, the standard library string here because you can't forward declare this std string there. So in fact if we go back to utils we do not want to import string there. And that's not right. I think I've got the syntax dvsn printf wrong. No, string size format list. String size format list. So what's that complaining about? Ah. That's interesting. Am I confusing my C++ containers? I think I might be. Yeah. Okay, let's create a string and then set the size to bytes. Resize. That's better. Okay. Right, so let's go over here to B record again. Uh, we are going to we want to write out a string to the serial port Oops. so where are our helpers send byte and receive byte Uh, no, we actually don't want a receive byte, we just want send. And we do want send byte. Uh, at some point we should probably make the debug tracing here a little bit nicer, but this will do for now. Okay. Uh, B record. Oops. Just throwing my mouse across the desk. Okay, so send a printf. Uh, the, we want the address in capital 
hex, followed by zero, zero, followed by a new line. That's all there is for that. Now for this, uh, so this zero, zero here is the number of bytes to send. And if it's zero, this means just execute from that address. So you can't send zero bytes. So if we do a write and the user asks for no bytes, just do nothing. So now we are going to the address to write to, followed by the number of bytes. But no a new line. And now we send a single byte and a new line. So hopefully that works. Well, we need a way to test it. So in order to test it, we're going to have to, well, we, I can fake up some code easily enough to write something to the board, but getting anything back might be trickier. Hang on a second. I can write to the UART. So that will transmit a character. Okay, the bootstrap loader is running. Now, uh, the UART is, uh, the easiest way to get the addresses is here. I believe we're using UART1. So, we want to write to the low byte of that address, 906. So if I just do write to 906, that's the wrong address. Okay, let's do that again. Write to the low byte of the 16-bit value at 906. And this is a big endian system, so the low byte is second. One byte, and we want to send a five zero. Wow, it didn't even wait for a return, but it worked. It sent a P. That is what uh, hex five zero is in ASCII. So the bootstrap is actually doing what I expect it is. So now let's just write some code. Um, I actually... I think it's worth doing this uh, in synchronize. So let us... send p because why not and i do actually need to prototype that Uh. 
So this will just be a bit more. Okay, uh, I bet that segmentation fault is due to my a printf routine. Actually, we can test that. Uh, the point of doing this is to just be a yeah. It's just be a little bit more robust about um, making sure that the bootstrap loader is present and behaving. Do I want SN printf? They write at most size bytes, including the terminating null byte. Down here we've got a thing on the return value. Return value functions SN printf and VSN printf. Oh, including the terminating null byte. So we don't want that because the C++ string is doing that for us. Turn value of size or more means the output was truncated. Yeah, okay. That should work. Uh, reset. Nope. Did you get any verbose tracing? We do not. Okay, that has failed somehow. So let us fire up the debugger. So we are step through the code, make sure there's nothing in the serial port, write our at sign, wait for data. Wait a minute, why is there a break there? We don't want a break there. We want to read back the at sign. That was incorrect. Uh, when does poll return zero? Uh, return value of zero indicates a timeout where you actually want to go back to the beginning again. And let's make sure the buffers are flushed before we Okay, that is simply not working for whatever reason. So we set the serial port, flush the buffers, write our at sign. We did not get any result. Flush buffers
Right, we're not getting anything out at all. So when things like this happen, let's just do that to see what happens. So we are writing the at sign, but nothing is happening. TTYS0, really? Okay, that's better. Um, it has got to this point because it's read back the read back something it doesn't understand. That is better. Got a. Four six instead of five zero. Well, five zero is P, four six is F. Why did we get an F? That honestly sounds like it is echoing back uh, part of the the B record. You can actually see that using the minus V option. Uh, ah, I didn't enable spew tracing. Spew tracing causes all the serial stuff to log verbosely everything that's happened. Okay, so so f f f f. Ah, five Fs, that's correct. Three nine three zero seven three seven is uh the address we we've, we've asked to send to send. Zero zero should be the count, which should be one. Why are we getting zeros there? It's actually called execute rather than write. Actually, these are not zero nibbles, they are zero bytes. That should never happen. I think something's gone wrong with my string again. Once we've done this, then we can get on to the interesting bit of the uh, the job, which is writing the 68,000 machine code blobs that we're going to upload. Okay, B record write, count is one indeed. Okay, eight bytes. nine bytes, that is eight, nine, ten. I misread that uh, man page, didn't I? It said not including now the functions that write at most size bytes, including the terminating null byte. You see, this should be the length of this string is 10. Ah, but size is not the same as the return value. Return the number of characters printed excluding the null byte. See, this is why I wanted to use the format library which does all this for you. 
Okay, so this sent. Yes. So here are our Fs. Nine zero seven zero one five zero return and then we get back the four six, which is a capital F. Yes. So let me just stick a leading new line on both of these just to see if we need to reset the the state machine. Uh, any value less than hex three zero, I believe, is considered a record separator by the bootstrap loader. Um, oh, yeah, one of the nice things about Ghidra is it does a reasonable job of trying to turn your machine code back into C. So here is the code that actually had, deals with bytes it reads back from the uh, serial port. So if you send a value that is smaller than the ASCII value for a zero, then it jumps to 5a here, which is the actual main loop. Let's just rename that. Now, it can't possibly be the case that we're sending stuff too quickly. So we are sending F uh, too many serial devices attached to my system. Okay. We are sending FF FF F nine zero seven zero one five zero. Out comes a P. So it works if I do it through the serial terminal, but it doesn't work here. Actually, we don't want to send terminating new lines. Oh, of course, every character you send gets echoed back. Right, so that's why we're getting the 4-6. So, in fact, what we need to do here in our send routine is... Uh, make sure that we get echoed back the right thing. Okay, so now you can see that we are sending our Fs and then getting back our Fs. So this has, we've got as far as five, zero, and now it's stuck there waiting for the response.
Let's try that serial terminal again. Okay, F F F F F nine zero seven zero one. Now five zero. Okay, the P came after the echoed back zero I sent. So again, this should work. So let's try putting back those leading new lines again to again reset the state machine in the bootstrap. Bingo! And it works. Good. Uh, I have to say the performance is not so hot, but we'll increase the board rate later. And we're not intending to do anything bandwidth intensive using the B record protocol anyway. That is actually extremely not brilliant. I should be able to do better than that. I wonder if we are somehow forcing a wait before every byte. So let's just try that with S trace. Uh, we are indeed we're calling poll, but poll should return as soon as uh, any data shows up. So ah, it'll do. Okay, so we have now we've now got to the point where we're synchronizing to the board. So let's just check stuff in. Right. Now, the next job Oh, actually we can do one thing which is command execute here is really simple. We're just going to do b record execute address. Duh. Job done. Now, let's go and look at the uh, the debug ROM again. You see. Because the bootstrap is invoked before anything happens on the chip, including running any code from ROM, you don't necessarily get any useful stuff like, you know, RAM working. So the bootloader comes with either 32 or 64 bytes of uh, data living at this address. So let's say it's 32. So that's 16, 32. And, and you can see it's immediately followed by a jump to the, the main loop again. What have we got? Uh, yeah. Um, so it's possible that we can overwrite this data with our own code here. The purpose of this is to allow you to upload chunks of machine code, which you can then execute. So we're going to put our routines in this. Now we don't have very much space to work with, which is going to be a little bit interesting. Now, I have the 68,000 assembler, so uh, we are going to use this to generate our routines. So, the first piece of code is going to be write uh, 
and just trying to remember how the GNU assembler works. I may have to take a break and do some reading up on this. The syntaxes of assemblers are always different. But uh, we want to basically... This is just going to be a simple stub that does nothing. We want to jump to main loop here, which is at 5a. So... That has successfully written. Uh, we should now have a huh, 68020 object file. So I should be able to dump that. And indeed, we have a jump instruction. So we need to now integrate this into our build system. So what we are going to end up doing is uh, each stub is going to be a single source file. We need to assemble it, link it to the right address, which is ffffffc0, and then turn it into a char array that we can include in our program so that we can upload it to the board. Um, so now can I compile this with just thinking the best way to do this can I compile that with GCC uh, I think I can this gives us rather saner uh, semantics when it comes to the flags. So the no I do need a LD I do need to I need to be able to call the linker directly rather than doing it through the uh, compiler driver which is generally the preferred way to do it so So our build stub function is going to take the just take the path of a source file uh, thinking about how to do this. Let's just go with that for the time being. So now we can say source equals source stubs string one dot s that will work don't care about that we want to build it with that we don't have any dependencies we'll probably want to do something about that later ah 
do indeed not have the C++ compiler. So that needs to be CC 68K, CC 68 Actually, this should work out the dependencies for me. But this ends up being CC. And then this also needs to be CC. Okay, so that should have assembled the thing into uh, yeah. So that should have assembled the file into there. So let's just disassemble it. There you go. Right, the next job is to turn it into a uh, includable header. And luckily we ha already have a rule for doing this, binning code, so um, Ah, oh. no, we can't turn that into. Well, it'll work. It's just he it won't do the right thing, right? So that has built. The problem is that it's turned the entire object file into the. Uh, the static array rather than just the uh, the code itself which is not what we want um, so we now need to be able to link it so we're going to add a link 68k so this is going to be LD sixty-eight K LD sixty-eight K flags. I uh, don't want libs there. Sixty-eight K. Uh, we want to give, give it. Uh, I was actually thinking that we'd want to give it a actual linker script, but I think we can get away with that one. Uh, because if we can we can specify the basic address layout using command line flags so this is going to be build uh, Nope, LD generates ELF files, therefore it, we always have to go through the ELF stage. So that's going to be uh, like so, except we now want to specify flags. And then build rule it should be link 68k. There we go. Cannot find st entry symbol start defaulting to a thing. So let's go to our stub. Uh, 
and we're going to need to declare that global probably okay so that has now successfully linked a thing it just hasn't done anything useful because it's uh, linked it to another relocatable file with no actual work done so can we put Is there a way to specify the segment? Here we go. So what we want to do is uh, text is going to go to and um, data will go immediately after text which automatically which is fine I think that might be it okay so what do we get if we dump this? Well, it's put our code in the right place, which is a good thing. I don't think... LD may be configured to support more than one kind of object file. That would be nice. that work that does not appear to have done anything useful I think we're going to have to call obj copy to convert it into an actual binary Yeah, I think that command is just not working in this setup. Oh wait, that's input format. Is there an output format? O format. O format binary. I don't think that's done anything, to be honest. So what has that actually done? So it should have written a thing there. But hasn't. Okay, let's just stop fiddling with this and let's just use obj dump as well. So we're going to actually emit an elf file. 
which does work that uh, generated the appropriate thing and we're going to have to now add another build rule to turn it into a binary just check that exists and in fact I might be able to skip a stage Because I can actually tell ObjCopy to turn this into a uh, into ah I can tell ObjCopy to turn a binary into a linkable object, but this is turning an ELF file into a binary, and let's just keep using XXD for the turning it into a uh, array stage because life's too short to fiddle with obj copy so local bin uh, that is stupid why am I doing it like that So this is going to be build d dot bin from obj copy sixty eight k. The input file is d dot elf, and the flags are going to be uh, o format uh, output target. Things. So I want to change the target or the format. I think I want to change the format. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do this. This is why I don't like using object copy. It's just a pain. There we go, minus O binary. So make sure, oh yeah, we need to add a rule here. So at this point, people may be asking why I am insisting on doing it like this rather than using make. The answer is essentially because I want it to work. Uh, make has some serious, serious problems, particularly when it comes to parallel builds. It is, well, that seems to have done the right thing. That, it's almost impossible to write correct make files. Uh, that hasn't generated a... Why is that not? It has not generated the bin file. It has generated an H file. I don't think that's the right one. Well, that worked. Ah, I know what I did wrong. There, there are there are the files. Yes, I want to. Uh, I didn't put an obj deer in the right places. 
So that's going to be this and this, which is the only rule, which is the only bit that's referring to a source file, becomes this. I spent way too much time struggling with make, trying to get parallel builds to work. And while this is a fairly simple program that doesn't need it, I've been thoroughly burnt by make's inability to, for example, have multiple output files from a single rule. And most make files only work accidentally. Which is why anyone who's used make's first reaction to weird things going on with the build is to do a make clean. Which works, but they shouldn't have to. In fact, we don't want a source there, we just want it like that. Stub, there we go. And there is our bin file containing four bytes, which is correct. And there is our h file containing practically nothing. And this is actually going to be stub. Okay, launch stubs write.h. So this generates this array which we can easily uh, import in here. So So now we have uh, our 68,000 machine code in the correct form that we can just uh, upload it. So let's just try a thing just to see if it works. Now we know that we can we know that we can send bytes to the serial port by using this kind of instruction. So that we could just do moves.b q2 ff uh, f f nine oh seven, which I believe was our UTX um, which was here we go, nine oh seven, and we should probably common these out into the into a single file. So that is very much shorter than I was expecting. See, this should be two instructions. Stubs right dot elf. See, this is five words of data, and that's four bytes. That's not right. Our bin is the right size. Yeah, okay. Because I put that initial stub on the end, that's not going to work. Let's just put it there for simplicity. And that's now the wrong file name. Ah. Right, and now we should have, there we go, and there is our data. And 
So this should write a value to the UART and then jump back into the uh, the bootstrap routine. So in write.c here, we can write our routine to the bootstrap and then run it and then uh, see whether we got the right thing out. And we have not included, okay, we did that wrong there. So what we actually want to do is to include the, uh, the header that we generated, which we can do like that. So now we have our stub embedded into our program and when we do a write, it will upload it to the board and run it and we should get back a queue. So let us try that. And these values are garbage. C equals 51, that's not a queue. But well, well it ran it, which is nice. But why did it not do what I was expecting? Okay, let's turn on more tracing again. So this was it synchronizing. So you can see here it's uploading our byte to 907, one byte, uh, five zero, and then we get back the five zero it wrote. Here we are uploading the bootstrap routine Uh, here we are telling it that we want to execute code. So F, F, well, yeah, that's C0 to there, followed by two zeros, which is the instruction to tell it to execute. And then we get a five, one, hang on. Five one Q it worked. Okay, that's nice. So we now have maybe either thirty two or sixty four bytes worth of uh, space to work with. And in fact, I've done this wrong. I don't want to work on write first. I want to do uh, read first because read is the thing that we can't do using the uh, bootstrap. Yeah. And in fact, the first thing I want to do is to dump the bootloader 
because the the bootloader I've got here in Ghidra actually comes from a different device and I know it's possible for the bootstrap loader to be customized. So let's just add the read stub. Let me go to read.cc include dot obj stubs read stub dot h is that gonna work? That works. Let's just copy this code. And then we want to uh, actually let's open let's open our output file first. not using PBLQ's timer code. All we're doing is reading bytes one at a time. So this is straightforward. So we want to uh, read a byte Never remember the the order of the okay, F put C B to F P do some progress. Like so. So what that will do, hopefully, is run the piece of code in the stub. Now uh, there's no way to pass in the start address and length yet. Uh, yeah, also this needs changing. Um, and uh, it, will it will download and run the stub and copy back whatever it gets up to it needs to know how long the yeah it needs to know how long the uh, the data block is length So in fact, we should be able to use that very same, same stub. Is that going to work? That's not going to work. Ah, didn't want to change that one. So we should be able to now, oh, uh, this is going to be bad. So let's turn that off. So let us read, these two are garbage, this one is in use. Ooh. 
It's created a file, but it was empty. So length was apparently zero. is not zero apparently. I bet the time was zero. Uh, let's just, if I run that in Valgrind it will not give me a stack trace. Yeah, uh, this is a division by zero error here. So has that read our one byte? It's read our one byte. Okay, so we need to just make sure that this doesn't cause division by zero errors if the time is too short. And the simplest way to do that is you just turn the time into a floating point value. This machine is quite a lot uh, faster than the machine I wrote PBLQ on. And because this is, so we now want to return s fractional seconds rather than um, a integer value, so And that has worked. It's returned one fewer byte than it should. Uh, that's because we do the we do the read, then we write the message. We have an incremented count yet. Count gets incremented between loops. Do I care enough to fix this? Yeah, let's just do it properly. Okay, so... sure why that is so garbage. So this is bytes divided by the number of seconds. Did I miscalculate the number of seconds? Ah, that's because this is a floating point number. Again, another good reason to want to use the format library. Right. Oh, 40k per second for reading one byte, which I'm sure is th thoroughly representative. Let's see if I can truncate that. Okay. And in fact, let's just do...
how to do nested functions in C++. It's one of the few good things about the language. Okay, now let's do some more stub work. Let's read dot s. I never opened read dot s. So we want to read values from memory and write them to the serial port. Now we do need to be careful about what we do with registers. Uh, I think the bootstrap here, the bootstrap documentation tells you which registers you can access. CPU registers D0 to D6 and A0 are used by the bootloader program. Really? Uh, I think that's incorrect because A1 here is actually pointing at the UART. So if we overwrite it, then we will screw up the bootstrap's ability to talk to the UART. We can get round that by actually jumping to here. That will reset the bootloader completely, which should be fine provided we don't want to change the board rate. But until I know that the that this represents the same bootloader that I got on the real machine, then I'm not going to touch it. Okay, so uh, we want to put. Don't think A two or up are used by anything. Okay. This is the start of the bootloader ROM. We're going to put that into A2. So we are going to read a byte from the address at A2 and put it and output it to the serial port. That will increment A2 we now need to compare A2 against 0 um, I think the easiest way to do that is to so we not auto incrementing a2 anymore instead we're using add q to do it and then we can say that we know we finished when a2 is 0 because that's like rolled over actually 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 I'm not going to do it like that I think we've got the space I'm going to put the number of bytes we want to write into d7 is D7 used anywhere? Uh, it's used there. Why? What's it doing with it? I don't see any other references to D7, to be honest. I think that instruction is doing nothing. Good, well let's just use D7 for the count. So we do want that auto increment. This becomes sub Q1 from D7. 
Then we are going to uh, branch if said. I think that's right to loop. And then we're going to exit. Uh, missing operand zero assumed. We might have to put that into a register. Let's just see whether that works. It still doesn't like this. It's possible that this syntax is not supported by the GNU assembler. This is using odd things. Yeah, I th think. Yeah, I'm just going to go look that up. Okay, yes, the assembler syntax is not the same one as used by Ghidra here. It's the apparently the Motorola or MIT syntax. Uh, anyway, this is how it works. Registers have percent signs on them. Luckily, this still works. Um, it's BNE rather than BZ. BZ was wrong anyway. We want to be branch if not Z. And this is what our code looks like. However, we aren't ready yet because we don't want to write until the UART will, is accepting uh, bytes. So where did I put my documentation? Uh, universal. We need to check to see whether the UART write buffer is full, and if it's full, we wait until. Well, it's not full. So we were looking for the TX status register. Here we go. UX transmitter register, 16 bits wide. Uh, so this is the high half, and this is big endian, so this is in the lower address. And this is the data part. So this is at 907, and this is at 906. And we want to uh, here we are. We want to we want the transmitter FIFO available bit. So that's bit 13. So we're going to do B test. We want to check bit 13 of the the uh, the 16 bit value at that address. And if it is uh, if it is zero, to say that there is no space available, we loop. So BQ loop. Uh, B test W. That is the right instruction, surely. B test. Do I have to read the value into a register first? This does actually seem to be doing just that, so uh, and it's using D5 for it. So let's just do move word into D5 B test 13 D5. Oh.
Interesting. Do I need to put a W on? No. So I don't think that's doing what I want it to do. No, actually, that will work. So, uh, 68,000 instructions, you specify how big the value you want it to operate on is. So what that's what these W, L's and B's are. L means a long, 32-bit value. Uh, w means a word, a 16-bit value. So this is loading, actually, just, just put in uh, So this is loading the value at tx into d5. What it's doing is doing a 16-bit access. Uh, however, btest here, which is operating on a register, is I think going to be a 32-bit value. Is there a b version? There is, right, there's a b version, but there's no w version but there is an L version. Okay, yeah. But that's okay because this is the bit number and of course bit zero to 15 have just been loaded by this. I believe that this will zero extend bit 17 and up, but we don't care about them. This isn't looking at them. So that's fine, that should work. Our code is a little bit long you see, it's a bit over our 32 bytes. So can I turn this into a shorter loop? Yes, we can. Say so that this is a... These are all short jumps. It should do that automatically, to be honest. And I think I can probably do that. Um... No, that's got to be a jump. I'm sure it's possible to make that work somehow because the address that we're jumping to is only just a little bit above start. But of course the assembler doesn't know that. So that is fitting in our 32 bytes. So I think that we can make that work. So let's try it. Now we should be getting back 512 bytes. So uh, start is ignored, file name is not ignored, length is ignored by this code, but we want the the read code here to use the right length. So okay, did we get anything? Hmm. Well, we got 512 bytes of data, but I recognize this data and it's all wrong. So what we've got here is in fact the boot ROM, not the boot ROM, the, the flash. This was actually, verifying this was there was one of the things I was going to do once I got this working. This is, ah, no? Oh no, I thought I scrolled to the wrong place. Uh, this looks like the stuff down here at E0. Which is 60 uh, 00 FF78. 6000 FF78. So I think it's just read 512 bytes from the wrong place. So did we get our stub? wrong. Yes, we did. That should be that. Hey, at least it worked. It's not quick, but it worked. Uh, it's not resetting. Hit the button. Okay, that's interesting. 
that suggests that I've managed to confuse the bootloader. So maybe it is using those registers. Right. Now this is more what I expected. Uh, the internal bootstrap ROM, the for some reason the top 256 bytes are empty. You can see that here in this version. The actual uh, bootstrap loader starts at F00, 256 bytes in, with 43F8. Yeah, I'm not going to compare this by hand, but this is definitely looking like the code I was expecting. Now, I still don't know whether this stuff here is mutable. This is whether it's RAM and not just ROM. But now that we have this thing working, we can find out. But first, I want to actually get parameters passed in. So the way we are going to do that is I think we want going to want to patch the instructions in the uh, actually yeah we're going to patch the addresses in these instructions but we want to do that in memory before we send it to the board. I mean, we could just do another couple of B record writes to update these addresses, but uh, that would be slow, so let's just do it locally. So these are going to be placeholder values, so let's turn them into something that the assembler isn't going to try to do anything clever with. And of course, they are big endian. So, I thought that was going to work. And sign char to const char star. Okay, so that loads reads it into a stub. We now want to write our uh, these two values into the string at a particular offset. So this is annoying, so let's produce another utility for it. This is going to be the high byte and of course these will all be implicitly cast to bytes. So. so 
So the uh, the address is going to be at offset two. Uh, the length is at offset eight. So this is going to be uh, now this wants to be the length, so this is going to be stub size. And this is the address. This is going to be uh, address of the first jar. Okay. So this should now read 512 bytes from address zero. Now, and then we hit, need to hit the reset button. Okay, and what did we get? That does indeed look 512 bytes, looks like 512 bytes from the beginning of the address space containing the boot ROM. So, uh, notice FF00 to begin with. So let's do that and hit reset. And it skipped the first byte. Right, that's worked. We are now reading data from the serial port. Slowly, let's just read uh, 8K and see how that goes. So, Yeah. Well, that is the maximum speed that the serial port can sustain. It's not brilliant, like 2k a second, but... And we have... 16k of boot ROM. Fabulous. All right, let's take a look at that stub. Probably doesn't want me using D5, to be honest. So, uh, this is the code where it decides what to do after reading each pair of uh, hex values. D6 here appears to decide whether it's a, uh, whether to execute or wait for more data. D5 appears to be used as the temporary. We could use D1. D0 appears to be something important. But D1 is reset right at the beginning of the main loop. So let's try D1. So reset the board. Read. Let's try that again. Nope, the board is still confused. One thing that might be worth trying is to see whether that compiles. It does compile. Uh, but I'm not sure whether it's good. Yeah, we can do this. So the reason for the minus two is that this is doing a 32-bit read of the value here. And because this is big endian, and we want the two bytes in the TX register to show up in the bottom half of the intermediate value, we have to decrement the, pro the address by two. So this is actually going to be reading from whatever's immediately above uh, TX, which I believe is 906.04. So that's going to read the RX register as well which I believe will have 
Uh, that will have a side effect in that I believe that it will remove a value from the uh, from the FIFO. Uh, yeah, I don't think we want to do that. So we're going to want to stick with this. But it is definitely confused somehow. So what registers are we... I didn't see an A2 anywhere. Um, so this is the code that actually executes whatever it was that you've been asked to do. The layout of this stuff is very strange. So this came from do execute here, which, what is that doing? Ah, oh, no, right, this, okay, this is testing it's moving d4 to d0, but it's testing the value of d of d4. So if it is nothing, if it's zero, then actually do the execution. Otherwise, um, continue on with this code. Yeah, I don't know why this is so unhappy, but we can try this. Um, we need to okay. Reset. Yeah. Anyway, the board did its thing, so if we try that again, that did not confuse the board. The board was fine and it did its thing. So. If we put that here, that will then write one byte. which it did. Try that again. Yep, that's fine. Uh, so I've now run out of things that could be going wrong. Okay, we're touching all the registers and everything is fine. And now it's confused. So I have to hit the reset button before it does anything. It's possible that something is misassembled, but it looks fine to me. And it is jumping to 5A, which is main loop here. 
Um, actually, let us uh, FF FF FE O O five one two. And we need to reset the board. Okay, we now have a bootloader ROM. So we're going to go over here to Gidra and uh, okay, so I'm trying to remember how this works now. So if you start up Gidro in the blank workspace, import the file, bootloader2, it's a raw binary and it's 68,000. Gidro doesn't actually know about stock 68,000s, so I'll just tell it it's a 68020. Uh, and this is starting at FFFF. FFE00, FE00, and we tell it to analyze as much as it can, and it's done, sod all, never mind. Just um, I just hit the D key to tell it to disassemble from this address. So I'll just create a function. Uh, you see here is the decompilation. This is all looks very familiar to be honest. Yeah, here is our main loop. Here is the temporary buffer, which goes down to E0, and then here is the branch to the main loop, and here are a lot of knobs. So this actually... Ah, I was wondering what all this stuff was, but of course, it's the program I just entered in, which is this, you know, 247C, 247C. And here is the source address, uh, here's the next instruction. Here is the dest Here is the length, and then here is the program that actually does the work. So actually, I should be able to tell it to assemble, disassemble that. There we go. Uh, so this is the UART. Ah, uh, that's... Where's that got a dot W on the end? Is that... Saying that... Uh, that's doing a byte access? Uh, so, a word access, rather? Ah, ah! I know why it's confused. This is not a jump instruction. We have, in fact, run out of space. That's fine. So you replace that with a knob. Yes, so it's hitting this. It's got it's an invalid opcode, so it's uh, in fact the first two bytes will be a for a jump, but the remainder has gone. Right, this actually proves that we only have 32 bytes of space because our attempt to write this overwrite this has failed. So we replace that with a knob, 
and now uh, when we reach the end of the loop it will just fall through to this branch instruction so now we should be able to do this okay it's confused wait for a reset and done do it again and it's happy okay we actually want this to be a little bit different so you want this to be a bit more robust so what we're going to do is <coughs> our stub is always going to be 32 bytes long Uh, and we want to fill it with knobs before and then we will and we want to make sure that it's it's, it's always 32 bytes long and contains is padded at the end with knobs. So it will neatly fill out to this point here. That means we don't need to bother with a return instruction on the end of the stub. We just fall off the bottom of the program and everything works. So this is also a utils. This is going to be Okay, so uh, if stub dot size is greater than thirty two, stub is too large. While stub dot size is less than thirty two, you want to write a knob which is a four e and a seven one. So that's this is terrible code, but. Okay, is this going to work? Okay. Yeah, no trouble. All right. So that's our read stub done. We now want to do the write stub. This is going to be a little trickier to test because we don't have any RAM yet. But this is going to be reading from, you know that uh, we don't need that. So here we have the address and length. We wish to wait for okay, URX. We want to wait to see if data is ready, which is handily in the same bit. So the set that code will work. If, uh, if there is no data, loop. Now our data has already is already in the low byte of D1. So we should be able to say that. And this is a this, this should write the low byte of D1 to the address here and return. So what does that assembled into? It's quite short. Hopefully that's correct. Decrement D7 and loop. 
So I don't believe we'll be able to write to uh, anything, but let's give it a try anyway. Uh, let's write, you know, just random stuff to address zero. But I haven't actually written any of the, the server-side code. So that's not going to do anything. Okay. So let's actually copy all of that. Stick it in here. So we get our right stub. Um, our length is we need to calculate that, which we could use of this code. So we execute and instead of reading bytes, we write them. So like that. Right now the board is dead. Okay. Right, it's doing its thing. And that. And now if we read this back. That's interesting. The board crashed. We sent it the right number of bytes. And as you see, nothing's happened. Uh, the only place we've got to write to is our little chunk of memory that our stub is inside, which is this. Is this still going to crash? Yeah, it's it's definitely unhappy. So it's the same code. I don't know why it would be unhappy. So if I now tell it to write an empty file and reset, okay, but it did do its thing, that is working.
all the same reasoning behind the register numbers should be valid. Unfortunately, we can't actually read back what it's written in because uh, we can't read anything back without replacing the stub. So that's DC, DD, and we've got EF, which is our knob. What does that if we do put an explicit knob in? Uh, actually, that's now shorter. Now if we put three knobs in, it should now be too big. To e0. Let's just check to make sure that doesn't work. Yep, stub is too big. Let's take out one knob. And the board is confused, so it's not the knobs that are the problem. And it is successfully writing the data. It's not, well, it's trying to write the data to ROMs. It's not working but it's not uh, hitting a exception or an access fault. Otherwise, we wouldn't see any progress at all. I am curious to know whether where that access exception came from, a floating point exception. Integer divide. Oh, it's because the length is zero. Uh, Switch that to a floating point number. Yeah, like that garbage, but uh, that's fine when you're asking it to do something stupid. Okay, well, that's wrong for a start. Okay, that's good. So let's just make the same change in in read. So are we still fine with reading? That's interesting, we're not. I know why. It's because uh, the my stubs, um, they read or write before decrementing the decrementing and, and comparing the length. So if we actually read some data, yeah. So if you try to, if you tell it you want to read or write zero, it just uh, it decrements the number to minus one. Note that it's not zero and just loops forever. Oh, 
Okay, so that's working. Let's try writing bytes. Okay, the only problem was the stubs. So, uh, the issue is that we would need to put our comparison test here. slightly bigger than it was but this is fitting just so what this is doing is uh, as the code flows down on entry to the loop our length was the last thing loaded so the zero flag is set from this when we uh, I need to make a few more changes Uh, next time through the loop, the last thing that touched D7 and set the zero flag was this sub Q. The branch instruction here does not affect the status flags. So that should work. So let's try reading zero. Did something. Okay, that is working. And let's try reading 100 bytes. Let's see if we can do the same thing for our right stub. So this is uh, branch to exit if zero. We are not branching to loop when we want to wait for data because uh, that is going to execute this BEQB again, and the Z flag has been set from the test here, so we don't want to do that. And then this wants to be a Brabi loop. So what does this look like? C, D, D. Okay, that's just fitting again. Let's try writing. Is writing 100 bytes, yes, and again, yes. Uh, make sure that this is now empty, right, yes, right, yes. Okay, it's fine. This is working. Okay, um, I wonder if it's worth trying to do high-speed transfers by changing the board rate. The issue with this is that once we've changed the board rate, then uh, using the old board rate won't work. The way I did it with PBLQ is there was a retry option. So the first thing you would do in a script was to do ping without the retry. This would connect to the device and switch board rate from the slow board rate to the fast board rate. Subsequent invocations would use the retry option that would skip the sync thing. It would assume that the device was already set up and in the fast board rate. Uh, it's n it was not terribly satisfactory to tell the truth. One thing I could do is to try and ping the board with both board rates to see which one works. Actually changing board rate is exciting. 
there's actually some code here to do it. Here we are changing the speed of communication. The problem is that the board rate control on the board is a two byte value and B records change one byte at a time. So you change the first byte of the two byte register and the register value changes and now your board rate is wrong. So the second byte isn't read correctly. So the instructions here tell you to, you want to change the register value from 0126 to 0038. You first change it to 0026 which changes you from 19.2 uh, kiloboard to 38.4 kiloboard. Then you issue another B record command to change it to 0038 that takes you to 115.2 kiloboard. Uh, that's not brilliant. But now we've got the stubs, we can do better than that because we can upload a chunk of machine code that changes the board rate in one go. That's like straightforward. So I think the first thing we want to do is to just read back what the board rate is set to, which we can do now, of course, which is at uh, 902. 902? We were at 907. Yeah, we're on UART 1. So... 902 board control register F902 2 bytes and that is 0126 uh, the reason why I wanted to know that is because there's actually several different uh, potential clock chips that can be used we are 32.768 or 38.4 and it will auto detect and set the board rate appropriately. So let's add a, another stub. to uh, U-Board 1. So this is straightforward. We just want to, ch to, to load 038 was the value, which is uh, O O three eight prescaler of three eight no divide and I think there's a table somewhere here we go one of hundred and fifteen point two is prescaler of three eight oh and divider of one really So why was O O three eight? Um So this is 902, this is 903. No. Yes. So 0038, the low byte is this end. Yes, so 38 is uh, 0011. Oh, here's 3F, so. 
So shouldn't the divider be being set? Yeah, um, I'm going to trust this table rather than the bootstrap mode code because the bootstrap mode code is full of typos. So uh, if we want the divider to, to be one, then this is, yeah, 138. And we want that to go into uboard one. There we go. and it will be padded with knobs. Uh, we sh assuming this works, we can actually go to f uh, faster board. Okay. So we actually want to do that here. So after we've waited for the device to be reset, we want to steal our stub handler code. Don't, we don't want that. Okay, uh, so we now want to write it and execute it. And now we want to switch board rates, which we do with this. Okay, so let's read 8K beginning of memory, see if this actually, you know, works. Uh, yeah, that failed to ping, so... That's wedged, reset. Okay. So let's All right. Now, what's that done? C0. Okay, this is it uploading the bootstrap. This is it running the bootstrap. It looks like we are still in 19.2 kiloboard. So this didn't work. Now we should get confused bootstrap when uh, Right, I know what's happening, which is we have sent the byte to tell it to change to tell it to do the execute and it's done it 
and then because the board rate's been changed the received byte here is corrupted so what we are going to do is wait for the uh, wait for the transmit buffer to empty then change the board rate so the transmit buffer is was in read so we want to load we want to read transmit buffer into d1 we then want to test it's tx we want to test for FIFO empty, which is bit 15. A branch, if it is not empty to entry. So we'll spin there until it's Uh, let's also put, let's just change that to the right name. Okay, let's try that. I'll just hit the reset button first. Uh, it didn't help. Should have. Bit 15, FIFO empty. Branch, if it's zero to start. Zero means it's not empty. So we'll only get to here when it is in fact empty. Then we change the board rate. Okay, let's take a look at this code then. Now 902 is uh, U board 1. So this is the bootstrap code itself setting up the UART. With 02. And if we look at our table, that look does not look right. The value I read was not that. The value I read was 3.8, as described in the bootstrap mode. Here. Uh, it was... It was 0.126. So where's 0126 coming from? Here. It's 
So it's obviously doing something with its set to a magic board rate value. Um, so at this point, A1 has been set to the address of the UART, which is going to be 900 in this case for UART1 or whatever the address is for UART2. So what's this 7? Oh, that's the that's the transmit. That's transmitting the uh, the at sign. So this is clearly thinking it's going to um, change the board rate and then immediately send something. This is the piece of code that sets up a one for the other. UART. Unfortunately, Gidra insists on displaying all these things signed, so addresses are difficult to parse. That's better. Uh, F423 is port E select register this FBOB is actually not documented oh hang on it is documented it's the watchdog timer FBOA is the watchdog so Yeah, never mind. Um, this is UART one. Ah, I keep putting the label in the wrong thing. Can I turn this into a pointer? Apparently, I can't. Anyway, that's not actually helping. So. Now the, these are the RX registers, F904. This is URX2. Okay, so this is writing something to the TX register. but it's a byte that is writing, so that's going to show up in the that's going to show up in the control part of the register the high end so what's it actually doing? E8 So E is one 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 zero. Eight is one zero zero zero. Okay, so setting the top three bits does nothing because these are all read only. Uh all it's doing is saying turn off uh control flow. So that's not very useful. Okay, well, let's try some no op code, changing the speed of the communications. Now, 126 is 19.2 kiloboards, so let's just do this. 
and let's go back to serial and the bit where we actually try to change the board rate let's just do that and this is actually now now working if I was actually getting that board right there wrong. Let's try putting that back in 3.8. No. Well, this seems to think that 115.2 is 0038, so that's worth a try. Nope. It thinks that 0026 is 38.4. So I think this is actually changing the board, but uh, you know what? I am going to do something a bit. Let's just not bother checking that. It may be that it'll sort itself out, and the ping that happens next is going to deal with this. So this wanted to be 138. Oh, uh... Let's try that. Okay, it's now pinging the board, but the board is not receiving. We should be sending P's constantly until something comes back. So let's turn on spew tracing again and see what this is doing. Because it may be. Ah, it only does it once. Oh, that's interesting and a little worrying. So it's mostly working. See, send 46, get 46. Send 39, get 39. Send 30, get 3C. 3737303C again. 35303C. Uh, let's just set that back to 38.4. And fastmode.s becomes the word 38. Let's try that. Four six 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 four six six six. That's like epically corrupted. Again, I'm just wondering about these tables. So let's see if there's another value. One two six. Oh, hang on. Oh, I just set it to stupidly high speed. 
Okay, let's just one two six is the correct value for this. One two six. According to that table, at any rate. Okay, that is working. It's faster now. So clearly, somebody is wrong about the the, uh, the serial port values. Though it's not like the performance was better. Interesting. Wait. Uh, so fifty-seven point six is two three eight. not working. So is this just my dodgy wiring? I mean I do have, I am have some parts on order and I am going to repair, repair the wiring, but that seems unlikely to be honest. Wait a minute. One two six. One two six. That's thirty eight point four. But this is the, what was being set for nineteen point two. I think our clock speed isn't at 33 megahertz and therefore that table is invalid. Let's let's try 0026. Change this to 38400. We change this to 026. Reset. But it's not happy. Okay, I have a logic analyzer, and that is clearly the thing that I need to, to get out in order to figure out what's going on here. And I don't think that will have made a difference. So let's put that back to 0126 and change this back to 19200. So that is happy. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. If the system uses a 32.768 kilohertz external crystal, the board register is initialized to 0126 after 19.2 BPS is set up, assuming the system clock is set to 16 megahertz. Don't suppose there was another table here with uh, yeah, and this is for thirty three megahertz. Ah, so I need to double everything. In other words, 
decrement the divider by 1. That gives 0, 0.026 for 38.4. But we tried that and it didn't work. That just presumably gets garbage. I don't know, actually, this does seem to be reading and writing the right things. New line. F, 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 nine, zero, seven, zero, one, five, zero. But then we never get anything back. But these reads of work have produced the right thing. Oh, oh, I know. It is because this is not checking to see if the TX buffer is empty. We need another stub. Uh, source stubs. Ping dot s. So this is so. Wait until the the TX buffer is uh, has a free space. Reply back with a P. So here in our serial code, instead of doing this, we have to get out another stub. So we can clean this up like actually create a class for stubs and not have to do all this horrible stuff. So pad with nops, ping stub, ping stub. Execute it. I uh, don't want to change speed anymore and receive a byte. Let's see what that does. And reset. Fabulous. So this has done the execute. Oh, hang on. Uh, 
I think I just told it to wait forever. No, that is right. So we should be getting back the P. I mean, it successfully changed board rate and does seem to be working. Okay, that is receiving back garbage. I think something is not working at that speed. So we're going to have to stick to 38.4. Um, is that a comment? No, is... Oh, hang on, I can do that. Yep, that's a comment. Well, that still doesn't explain why this isn't working. So it's, it is echoing back the... echoing stuff back correctly. But then the receive byte here is not receiving anything. Are we correctly writing to the... Uh, well, should we move for a start? But it should be a synonym, not make a difference. Well, we could just try it without the ping code at all. So we reset. Okay, but right, that's what I expected was to happen, because it's the same thing we have here. It's uploaded the stub, it's called the stub, but we're not getting anything back. Now, it's possible that the transmitter is in some kind of state. But that seems unlikely to me, to be honest, because like it's echoing back the data. And the code's not complicated. Where is it? Uh, 
So we read a byte, we check to see whether a byte was actually received, otherwise we loop. Then we write the byte straight back to the TX register to send it out. Yeah, that's all there is to it. Yeah, this was my code here, so I can't rely on that being anything resembling correct. I am very confused. So what happens if I leave it at 19.2 Does this work? Yes, it does. So our ping is doing the right thing. So uh, execute waits for a reply back from the board. So the board's transmit buffer should be empty when execute returns. We call CF set speed, which will presumably flush the buffers. Um, we are then successfully transferring the stub to the device and, as far as I can tell, executing it. But nothing happens. I wonder if the... Is the stub not making it to the board correctly? Uh, let's once again turn on spew tracing. Well, they all look like pairs, except for that one. That's not a pair. OK, I just think that what's happening is the transmission's being corrupted at any anything faster than 19.2 kiloboard. That's bizarre. It's got to be better than that. OK, well... Let's just go with this then. Uh, actually, before I save it, let's just... So this should hang. And let's put this stuff back. It 
It sounds like that the transfers are unreliable enough that my transfer routines probably also want to do a checksum. That'll be interesting. I need to try and f make a stub containing a checksum. We don't really have a lot of space to work with. Yeah. Okay, now let's comment this out. And change that. And now it works. Possibly I need to crank the thing up to thirty two up to thirty three megahertz. It seems unlikely though. That would involve looking up all the system clock stuff. The clock generation code. But uh Well, I now have a f functional tool. All the bits should work, including the serial terminal. It's not, but it should. I'll look into that later. That's less of a priority. Uh, we can read, we can write, we can probably execute, but as I can't actually try don't have any RAM to transfer programs into, I can't test that. So that is a good start. We can now dump the ROM very, very slowly. Uh, I already have a copy of the ROM for this thing. Um, it may be possible, depending on how the flash chip works, to reflash it very, very slowly and possibly with corrupt transfers. So that's actually a good place to stop. I think the next thing to do is to try and set up the DRAM, and I'll just add another command for that. Uh, but I think that's good. I don't think we need this anymore, to be honest. This is for dynamic board rates. Oh, uh, no, it's still being used there. Never mind, I'll leave it. Okay, well, uh, I do not have a GitHub repository for this set up yet, but I will do that shortly and push it. I think that makes a good far too long video. So I'm going to leave it there. This is now a pretty useful tool and I will, I'm sure, have fun exploring what's inside this machine. I hope you enjoyed this video and as always please let me know what you think in the comments.